Good morning, Haven family, and welcome to those of you who are guests watching online. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. My name is Brian Brooks, and I have the wonderful privilege of being the pastor here at Haven Community Church. We have been going through a message series on the Gospel of John, but we are breaking this week. Uh, we're going to be uh, hosting a forum on racial unity and reconciliation that we're calling Undivided. Some have asked us why we're doing this now. Uh, obviously, the events of the past week have made it appropriate for us to do this. As a church, we have built into our vision statement that we are an intentionally diverse church. And uh, since we launched back in 2011, we have made it a point to be the kind of place that no matter who you are, what your background is, that when you step through these doors, you feel welcomed. We have modeled this by having real relationships. Uh, but, you know, even over these many years, we've not had these deeper conversations, and the time is just right. The Bible tells us that for those who call on the name of the Lord, it's, it's really and truly inconceivable. It's unthinkable that someone who calls himself a Christian could despise somebody who looks different from them. The Bible tells us that if anyone claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister, that they are a liar. Because anyone who does not love their brother or sister whom they've seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. The Bible tells us that we who call on the name of the Lord have been given this ministry of reconciliation. God reconciled us to himself, and he has now given us this ministry of reconciliation. Jesus says that for the believer that we are the light of the world. It is Christians who should be on the forefront of this. Micah 6, 8 tells us that he has shown you, O mortal, what is good to, and what does the Lord require of you, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with the Lord your God. I was reading just this past week in the book of Hebrews, and this verse from chapter 13 just popped out of the pages as we're thinking about, again, all that's happening in our nation. Continue to remember those who are mistreated as you yourselves are suffering, Hebrews 13, 3. But with all of this, the, the image that pops out of the page of Scripture, perhaps more than any other for me, is that throne room scene from Revelation 5 where we see uh, the scripture is telling us that it is Jesus, the lamb who was slain, who is worthy to open the, the seals because his blood has been shed and he has made the way for, for those from every tribe and language and people and nation. And certainly here on earth, we have to model this. And so we want you to know, especially for those of you who may be new to this conversation, that the intent here is not in any way to put false guilt upon you. Uh, I was uh, talking to my son this past week, and he mentioned a, a very good friend of his, a, a young white man uh, who's about 26, was feeling guilty because he says after 26 years of life, he's just realizing that the things that he thought had passed away back in the 60s is still very alive. And I said to him, Matthew, you've got to make sure that you, you free him of guilt. It's great that he's becoming aware now but, you know, the scriptures tell us again in 2 Corinthians 7.10 that there is a, a godly sorrow that brings repentance, that leads to salvation, and leaves no regret. It's a, 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 a worldly a, a sorrow that brings death, and we're not trying to put that on anyone. We're, we're praying this morning that as you watch this, that you will watch with an attitude that says, I want to listen, and I want to learn. There are many people, of course, who are talking about this uh, today, and uh, there are lots of great resources. We're just one voice that wants to say we want to address this too. For our community, for our congregation, we want to provide you with first steps to say how do we engage this conversation, this very difficult conversation on racial unity and racial reconciliation. Let's take a moment just to pray, and then I'll introduce our panel. Lord, thank you so much again for your presence with us. Thank you, God, that uh, this is on your heart. Jesus, we think of when you were here on earth, that you spoke out against the racism of the day, when you loved those that your own people despised, the Samaritans. I pray, God, that this would be a healing conversation. 
I pray, God, that as we speak, Lord, that these would be words of life, that, uh, God, every one of us here on this panel would be changed because of the time we spend together. And we pray the same for all those who are watching online. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, uh, we would just like to introduce our panel. I want to start by introducing my beautiful bride, Maria. Uh, we've been married 31 years. We've been together since 1981. Is that right? Uh, 82. 82. Right here. Forgive me, but uh, a long time. Most of our lives. And uh, uh, when I first became a Christian, uh, she came to Christ shortly after I did. Uh, we've grown together. When I stepped into ministry, it was really her words that had me saying, uh, let's do this. So thank you for being with us, Maria, and thank you for being with me. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Chief Golden, Marysville Police Chief, and uh, uh, Chief Golden and I met this past week, had a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I was very encouraged by our time together, Chief Golden, and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And you're welcome. I enjoyed it also. I want to introduce Maria Ford. She's been a part of this con conversa uh, congregation for uh, really from almost the beginning. And uh, Maria is an employment professional with the state of Ohio. Maria, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I want to introduce Mike Slagle. Mike and I have been friends since the beginning of this church also. And uh, Mike is a campus minister, minister with uh, Crew. And Mike, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. And uh, Tim Stauffer. Tim is a professional counselor with Beacon Counseling Center in Dublin. Uh, again, Tim, we are so glad that you're with us, and we know you're going to bring a lot to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. So, so the format of the time today, we're just going to we're just going to ask some questions. We had several questions that came in from our congregation. You know, this is a big, big topic, as we all know. Uh, none of us have all the answers, uh, and, and yet we're hoping to be another voice to this. Uh, just for, again, just for those of you who don't know me, I, I want to say a little bit about myself and then ask a few of us, you know, about some of the experiences you've had in life uh, dealing with uh, this issue of race. I, I grew up in Jamaica. Uh, I was 19 when I came to this country in 1981. Uh, Quite honestly, I come out of privilege. My father was a doctor at the University of the West Indies. Uh, because of that privilege, I was able to come to the United States and I was able to, to go to Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Uh, but I remember just that first week that I was there at Georgia Tech, uh, me and a group of other students and my Jamaican roommate uh, were visiting uh, different aspects of the campus, was part of the orientation group, and we went into this fraternity house and it was a little different from us culturally they're playing their country and western music and I didn't think anything of it uh, but I very naively thought that the racism that I had read about in the 60s was in the 60s and then all of a sudden we're getting taps on our shoulders saying you need to leave you need to leave and I thought initially they were talking about the group but then I saw me and my Jamaican roommates standing outside I'm going What's going on? I remember when I was uh, interning with GE in the summers in Daytona Beach, uh, me and my, my roommate at the time, who was uh, African-American, uh, we were looking for an apartment on the, the beachfront. And we go to this one apartment and see the sign, room for rent. And they look at us and say, uh, the room's been taken. And we thought, OK, well, it's been taken. And <laughs> We come back a few days later, the sign's still up. There have been things like that that have happened throughout the years. And, and, and I, you know, just not too long ago, I was walking into Kroger in Westerville, and this woman comes up to me and says, I'm not afraid of you. And I scratch my head and say, well, I certainly hope not. Uh, we've seen things happen with our kids. You know, uh, our daughter, when she was in... in um, in Westerville School, uh, there, there was an incident related to race. I don't even remember what it was. And there were some students, some white students, that, that came in wearing white hoodies with a pointed top. And my daughter wanted to speak out against it and uh, to meet with the principal. And it was sort of swept under the rug. Uh, and things like this happen over and over. Now, our, our experience is nothing like the experience of the black man, the black woman who is growing up in the hood and they are seeing 
you know, sirens going off every night. They're seeing gunshots going off. They're seeing uh, drug deal dealers dealing at the corners. It's, I don't have the same experience. And so it, it's not that we all have the same experience, but we have experiences that make very clear to us that this issue of racism is alive and well. I, I was just wondering if any of you had other experiences that you'd like to share. Um, Maria? Sure. Um, it's funny. I just actually this week or over the past few weeks with the things that are going on in our country, I think I've been forced to kind of think about that myself. What have I experienced? And the Lord brought to mind a couple of things um, from years ago when I was young. And one in particular I wanted to share because um, I think that it um, might point out sometimes why people react um, the way they do to things that seem just simple. So I do remember we grew up in a um, predominantly white neighborhood um, when I was about, I was probably at that time, probably about seven or eight. And one of my good friends had a party and all my friends were getting invited and I never got an invitation. So one of my, it was a, a white um, friend of ours that was having the party and um, one of my other friends said to me, well, it's probably because you're black. And at that time, I didn't remember, I hadn't remembered that story in forever. And just this past week, I recalled that. And then it brought to mind an incident that happened when we moved to Westerville, where a good friend of ours had a party for her son. And we had just recently moved into the neighborhood and my son didn't get invited. And I became the mama bear. <laughs> and I actually called her and was, very upset and said, do you have a problem with my son? Which is very irrational, <laughs> I know, but <laughs> I did. And she was totally taken off guard and said, of course not, he's a child. Why would I have a problem with him? And it kind of caused a rift in our relationship for a little while and then we got over it. And then bring, rem, being reminded, I believe the Lord brought it to mind that I probably need to go back and apologize to her, but it's because of what happened to me mm -hmm as a child, it stuck with me and it uh, triggered that, when that incident happened, it triggered something in me that had nothing, pro probably had nothing to do with why he didn't get invited, you know, for whatever, whatever reason. So sometimes when um, people respond, it may, it's because of the, the things that have happened to them in their lives. So I think it's good to keep that in mind when things happen. So I'd like to comment, because for many people who know me, I present as white. And not that I go around saying, hey, I'm white, I'm white. But what they don't know is I have a black father and a Mexican mother. So I have more color in my little finger than most people have. Um, so my earliest memory, my dad was very active um, in the civil rights movement. And my earliest memory uh, of him was him taking, we, there were six of us, six kids. He took us all to court one day, sat us outside, and that's when you ha could have kids that go into the courtroom as long as they were quiet. And he was actually the defendant, um, and someone had called him out of his name, and he punched that person. And um, I remember the judge being just so kind and so compassionate and dismissing the case um, and calling it for what it was. He said, you know, that this is blatant racism. And so my dad, after we had left the courtroom, he said, I want you to know that not everybody holds the same views that we do. And even white people <laughs> um, don't hold racist. There are many white people that don't hold racist views, and I needed you all to see that. And I was really young. I was probably five. Um, but I, I never forgot that. But then fast forward, because like Maria, you know, things that happen in your um, childhood, that's what, that's what molds you. So last year, I have a son, um, and uh, I have many sons, but uh, my son was, uh, had, a, had a light bulb out in his truck. So I said, you know what, before it gets dark, let's go, and let's get this taken care of, right? So we're driving, and I get stopped. And the police officer was so kind. He said, oh, I just wanted to let you know you have a light out. Don't want you to, you know, want to make sure you get it fixed so nothing happens. Thank you. Everything was good. So I'm 
looking at my son, and he is shaking. He said, Mom, I was pulled over yesterday and given a ticket for that very light. He said, I can't help to think that it was because of my skin color. Now, all of my children are darker than I am, and they are, they are outwardly um, uh, present as, as African American. And, and he was so upset, he said, what happened to you was because of your skin color. What happened to me was because of mine. And so at that point, I remembered what my dad said, but it was really difficult to say. Not everybody holds, I mean, and I did say it, but not everybody holds those same racist views. However, when things like that happen, it makes you pause and say, hmm, was it, was it because of my skin color? Was it because of his skin color? Um, so th those things have happened throughout my life and throughout my children's lives. A and, and you have to, for, for white people, it's, it's never an issue because it doesn't happen. For black people, it's always an issue. Yeah, I think, I think when things like that happen, sometimes we do scratch our heads and, and wonder, was this really what racism or do these things just keep happening? Okay. <laughs> um, my son was pulled over a little while back, a couple of years ago on July 4th, and uh, he was given a, he was pulled over for having a light out in the daytime mm -hmm. and given a ticket. And, and uh, I was speaking with a friend of mine, my, my running partner is a police, uh, former police officer, and I told him that story. He's a white man, and, and he, he, he was like, what, to give me a ticket in the daytime? And you, you, you scratch your head, you wander sometimes, you know. Um, I, again, had a really wonderful conversation with, with Chief Golden this past week. And, and Chief, you told me a story about your own background as a young man growing up in playing system. Would you share that story? Sure. Uh like I, I told you in our meeting, I grew up in Plain City. Plain City back then, as you can tell, was a long time ago. Uh, uh, and it was a farming community, uh, maybe the village, 2,000 people at the most, uh, had uh, one or two little restaurants in town. It was pretty much just a little rural village at the time. Uh, and for whatever reason, I was out late at night, it was a uh, I was probably about 17, I'm guessing, and this was in the 60s, so this was probably 63, I would imagine. And I, uh, there was a, at the west edge of town, there was a small truck stop, a little restaurant, and a car dealership there. Well, I just happened to be in the, uh, the restaurant. Uh, uh, it was late at night, probably midnight or so. Uh, Probably wasn't much later than that because my parents would have had me <laughs> otherwise. So anyway, I was sitting at the counter, and uh, just I was in there, and at that time, the grill and things was right on the other side of the counter, and the lady was fixing whatever it was I had ordered. And we were just talking, and pretty soon she says, I wonder what they want. And I looked around, there wasn't anybody else there except us. And, but at the restaurant, there's a large picture window. And uh, I get a little boastful about this. Uh, anyway, uh, she says, no, at the window. And I looked, and I saw three people there, uh, three black people. And they were just staring in the window. And so I said, well, I could go and see uh, what it is. And so I walked to the door. Uh, this was my really first uh, experience with racism or the effects of it. Uh, I walked out and I, I asked them, you know, was there something they wanted or did they get something to eat or whatever? And they said, we were just wondering if we were allowed to come in. Mm. And so that that really affected me. I you know, was a young man and uh, like I told you before, I've told that story many, many times. And it's something that's uh, from being a young white kid, not ever experiencing racism, mm -hmm. uh, it was an experience. And so I think that kind of tempers you a little bit for the rest of your life, kind of gives you something to think about. So, you know, not nearly like uh, a Maria's or, or yours or anyone else of color, uh, but it's something to see from, uh, like, my eyes that I saw. Yeah. You know, it's hard for me sometimes to, 
to see what other people see because I haven't had the experiences sure. or the native experiences or even the good ones. Sure. Uh, so, you know, it makes you sometimes wonder, you see these TV shows where someone has taken somebody else's body for, you know, whatever reason and they and the, and what they experience from that. So it would be nice to, if there was some way that, you know, everyone could see the other side and listen to the other side and experience those things. Yes. You, you know, as we have this conversation, um, my daughter, Lauren, uh, I thought about this afterwards. Her name is Lauren with an L, but she shared with me f uh, four L's of racial reconciliation. And, and the first two are to listen and to learn. And what we're hoping for our audience today is that you would have that openness to listen and to learn. We want to listen and learn from each other. I'm going to give you the, 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 the other two at the end of the, the talk we have here, but listening and learning is so, so important. And uh, there's so many voices out there that, that want to bring division. We're calling this, this panel, this talk, Undivided. And uh, one of the things that I, I, I know has brought, you know, very quick healing in, in these types of things is when uh, police departments, law enforcement, enforcement officials come alongside those who are saying we're hurting and we see uh, this listening happening. And I appreciate the conversation we had. I, I had a few questions that came in, uh, Chief Golden, that were directed to you, uh, if I could share those with you. Um, uh, this young person, this is a young person in our congregation, a young person of color, says thank you so much for taking the time to do this and thank you for your service to our community as chief of police. As chief of police, what are you doing to ensure justice and safety for all the citizens of our community, but especially for minorities in our community? How, how would you respond to that, Chief? I, I guess I would respond by, uh, you know, it's not something that you just go to instantly is something you have to plan for and prepare your agency for. And uh, literally we start clear back in the background process. Uh, there's several criteria to become an officer with the Marysville Division of Police. Uh, if someone successfully completes the background and they're given an oath of office, which they're required to swear to that they'll, you know, support the constitution and and treat people impartially and equally. And we hold them to that. We have uh, policies in place for that. One of the uh, big things that's happened in the last four or five years, and, and it started at the governor's office at that time, was something that's called the Ohio Collaborative for a Police and, and Community. Uh, it's, a, it's a board of 12 members uh, from uh, religious uh, sections, uh, public safety and business and so forth. And they set up a list of criteria for law enforcement agencies for certification. And just kind of as a, an idea here, uh, a little recollection, uh, over the last three years, we've received a certification for community engagement, uh, body-worn cameras, telecommunicator, telecommunicator training, bias-free policing, investigation employee misconduct, line of force, and recruitment and hiring. And each year, there's a different set of standards that are put out. Mm -hmm. Now, each one of these standards uh, that compares that to our policy and procedure, and our policy and procedure also has follow-up on it. It's not just put out there as a piece of paper to read, and that's it. There's follow-up. Uh, and once we uh, reply to this collaborative board and they come out and actually inspect our policies and interview us, uh, then uh, that's in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly that's it. And, and so we're really guided by those things. And, uh, and it's all about accountability and transparency. Yeah. And, and over the years, things continue to improve, I think. You know, I, it's, I, I hear, hear stories about People being stopped for various things, and uh, you know, one of the things if you go to some kind of event, somebody comes up and tells you, "I got stopped for five over the speed limit." What do you think about that? You know, the little things. But uh, so uh, I, I think in our community, uh, we try to treat everyone the same. I don't know that we have anything that specifically uh, pinpoints uh, minorities. Uh, everything is pretty much in our procedures. Uh, 
as to be equal, and that's what we want it to be equal. Yeah, we, we uh, those of us who are living in Marysville know that we had a, a protest here in town uh, this past weekend, I think it was, and uh, uh, after we talked, Chief Golden sent me a, a text. Would you like to describe that for us, Chief Golden? Well, we've, we've had uh, three of these protests this week, had, uh, and, and, and they were all good, and they were all peaceful. Uh, one was a little noisier than the other, but uh, they were all peaceful. Uh, had one on Sunday, and then Monday evening, uh, much smaller, I think there was about 12 people. What, one of our officers actually stopped by and joined in the, in the protest to express his concern about things that are happening around the world. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I think I even sent you a picture of him, perhaps. Yes, you did. And yes, then did. Uh, yesterday, in the sweltering heat, there were several people out there, and I stopped and, and talked to them to see if they needed anything and, and uh, let them know that if they want to step back in the pavilion where it's a little shadier, that was up to them. So, yeah. so uh, but it's, it's, it's all been good. Yeah. I think they need to get the message out. And, th and that image that, that Chief Golden sent me, apparently the officer there who had joined with the protest said to the protesters, hold your signs higher. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, what, what we're seeing is that, that wherever there has been uh, the willingness to say, let me listen, let me learn, uh, there's been healing. And, and this is what we're asking. Y you know, it's interesting because the phenomenon of, of racism is essentially that I, I take a subset of some group, I have a very limited interaction with this group, and I assume everybody of that group is like that. And so there have been many peaceful protests, and I have participated in that with my son. And uh, when I talk to people about this, uh, the, they immediately go to the rioting and the looting, and that's been there. We can't condone that by any means, but, but at least from my limited experience with the protests in town, they've been peaceful. And th that phenomenon of racism where I take this subset, people are, will see this small group of people who are rioting and looting and saying, let me make a, a, an assumption about every, anybody who's protesting. And it's the same thing, actually, that we'll see uh, what happened uh, with, with uh, abuse of authority within law enforcement. And people will say, well, police are like that. And that's the same phenomenon. We, we, can't, we can't condone that either. Uh, certainly, if we are uh, whatever group we are part of. So I, I'm, I'm speaking for the body of Christ. When, when we see things that are wrong, among people who call themselves Christians, we, we ought to call that out and say that's wrong. And likewise, uh, we, we, we press law enforcement to say when you see something that's wrong, to say it's wrong. And, and you know, when I wrote Chief Golden, um, you know, I said, and I'm saying this again for our audience, uh, law enforcement is a profession to be honored and to be esteemed, uh, and, and we want to do that. But we also want to ensure that, that uh, when we see abuse of authority of any sort, we speak out against it. And I, and I know, Chief Golden, you're, you're making a statement on that that's going to be before the City Council this coming week. I want to thank you for that, sir. Right. I, uh, I won't be at the council meeting Monday night, but my dep I prepared a letter uh, uh, on like a letter of support like we've discussed and it'll be read by one of my deputy chiefs to the city council meeting Monday evening. Thank you so much. So, uh, so I appreciate you. So, so speaking again of the phenomenon of, of racism, why this happens, you, you know, I th you know t Tim and I, uh, Dr. Tim Stauffer and, and I were speaking last week, uh, yesterday, sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess as this is being broadcasted, that was last week. Uh, but, but Tim, wh why does this happen? You know, you, you know we see that uh, one of the, the, the sad things and why, why some uh, don't even want to engage this conversation is because we're so ingrained with a way of thinking. We're not open to learning. You know, one of the people asked, you know, uh, it seems that people believe anything that they see that supports their own view. Wh what is that about and what is the antidote? How, how do you respond to that, Tim? Yeah. It's a complicated question, and, and I think one of the, the aspects of, I think, American culture or Western culture is that we tend to try to be really simplistic about things. We um, have sometimes called it like a microwave culture where we want immediate results and immediate change, and, and can we just get this fixed? And it's a really complicated phenomena. Uh, I think one, of, um, one way to understand the, the resistance for some people um, has, is related to uh, the willingness of people to 
take the, the, the viewpoints of another person and often find that very threatening. And so there's a psychological principle um, called the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error, um, in essence, says that I will ascribe to myself positive motives and I will tend to see any problems that I have personally as driven by external circumstances. So if, I, if I'm wrong about something, you got to understand my circumstances. I mean, I was under a lot of pressure. It's like life is really hard, man. I, I, I snap because of external pressure. And, and so the fundamental attribution error gives oneself a pass and says, hey, we're all, we're all imperfect. Man, don't be so hard on me. I, I have um, all this stuff coming against me. Um, however, for people who are in a different group, the fundamental attribution error says you have an internal problem. Like you have a character problem. Something's wrong with you. And I'm going to attribute your craziness, your chaos, your problems, your attitude, your behaviors, I'm going to ascribe that to an internal characteristic that, that is demeaning to the person. And so there's this deep um, reality that we all experience is we like to give ourselves a pass but hold other people responsible, um, and particularly within group, we do that within groups. And so um, in many ways, that's what racism is. Like a good definition of racism is where there's a, a people in a position of power and authority and a system will ascribe to other people something related to their race and use that as the reason for which to um, exert control. Many people, I think, resist the idea of talking about racism uh, because there's this assumption that racism is just simply the capacity to hate another person that looks different than them. And so it's easy to say, well, then everybody's a racist because don't we all hate people? Don't black people have the capacity to hate white people? And it's like, well, yeah, of course they do. Um, but it's not racism because there's not a systemic oppression that goes that direction. Um, but racism, white culture has oppressed black culture and black people for 400 years within our country or longer. Uh, and so, so there's a system that's oppressing people. And people are really hesitant to change because to change means to confront our own internal, like to move from an external explanation to say, I have implicit bias, I have um, belief systems, I have ways of functioning that are going to oppress another person in order for me to have what I have or for me to have the position that I have is very, very difficult for people to do. Yeah. It's very, it, un it untangles the entirety of your way of thinking. And so, so it's really hard. Um, some of the other components, and we talked about this um, yesterday when we were when we were chatting, is that that different people are at different places in their readiness to change. I, I think one of the things I'm I'm a bit encouraged about. I'm I'm kind of withholding judgment at this point about whether or not this is the case. I think I've seen a, a greater openness within white sure. community to address issues of race. I hear people, I think as a good example, I hear people who would have besmirched um, Colin Kaepernick for kneeling at the anthem. I see way more people saying, oh, maybe we would need to rethink what that means. Perhaps we need to see that through a different lens than we saw it over the past number of years. And there's more people willing to take an honest look at that. And I'm grateful for that, and I hope those kind of processes continue. Um, the reality is, and we talked about this as well, whenever these topics get conversed about, there's always a blowback phenomena. So, right. so people who are not ready to change but are forced to confront something, that often leads to a reaction um, and leads to some sort of blowback where we're going to work to equalize the system. It's like um, there's pressure builds within the system, and there's an intensity, and everybody has to do something to try to equalize the system. Violence and looting is actually a way to do that. So, so within the for for protesters and for rioters, there's often a phenomena of of looting will create a way to dispense the internal energy, and it can equalize the system. White people will often do something similar, but in much more um, in much more in systemic ways rather than in 
really bold-faced actions that are really aggressive. It can happen individually, but we'll probably see a blowback from white community that's entrenched to the current chaos that mm -hmm. will try to equalize the pressure. And, and, and people struggle with change. Change is really, really hard. Um, and I would be getting long-winded, but there's a whole theory of change um, where, where we can be more ready to change than other times. Um, and I'm hopeful that people have the courage yeah. to look in the mirror and say, it's time. What's yeah. happening in my heart? Yeah, it, 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 I, I, I do think that the, 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 the events of the past couple months have really made this, this prime. You know, you think, again, of us all being in isolation due to COVID-19, everybody on their screens, and then, of course, just the age that we're in, that this, uh, we see things immediately on social media, and I think people are becoming aware. I think back to, to some of the things that, that affected change in the, in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement. It was those images of, of, of dogs being put on people, and people said, is this really happening? And people are seeing that now, and so uh, many people are more open to change. Um, so I'm going to ask you kind of a big question here, Tim, that I, I, I don't know if you can, uh, well, if you have the answer, boy, uh, I'll just ask anyway. This is coming from uh, one of the, the, the white men in our congregation who happens to be, to be married to a black woman, and he, he describes a number of the things that he's seen his wife go through. Uh, so he's observed this, and he asked this question, how can systemic racism be addressed when white people will not admit to their own personal prejudice? It can't. <laughs> It can't, and, and, and I think I would answer this through a theological lens um, and not a psychological one, although there's probably some overlap. Um, if true justice is going to be established, the oppressor must release and free the oppressed. Um, and it's a deep scriptural principle. It's, you, you, we read it most clearly with um, the Israelites in slavery and bondage in Egypt. Um, God, in his grace and mercy, came repeatedly, ten times, came back to Pharaoh and said, you must let my people go. Let my people go. Um, and Pharaoh continued to harden his heart, and, and the plagues of God came on that culture because they were unwilling to release the oppressed. Um, and so true justice to be established must mean a release of the oppressed and it requires the willingness for or the desire for embrace of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. so, so we must release the oppressed and also have the desire to reestablish relationship that's, that is collaborative and reciprocal and mutual and invite the oppressed back and embrace yeah. them, the, the, the oppressed. Um, that also requires that the people being oppressed also need to have a desire to embrace the oppressor once justice is established. Right. And we will see, um, apart from Christ, we don't have a model for that. Like, that yeah. doesn't happen. The book of Philemon is the, is the New Testament story of that. Paul is saying to Onesimus, I'm, I'm going to help you. I want you to be set free. But he goes back to Philemon and says, you must release Onesimus and then welcome him back as a brother yeah. um, because he has something useful for you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the answer. Yeah. Like, uh, but, but it's, will we get there? I like, yeah. yes and no. Yeah, Tim, I, I think, I think you, you're right on. And, and, and this is why I am convinced it is the church that should be taking point on this. Absolutely. We, we, we have, we who know the Lord we don't come to Jesus until we acknowledge our own wrongdoing and say, Lord, forgive me. And there's something powerful in that moment when we acknowledge that and understand that, that Christ wipes away our sins. He makes us right with him. And we've seen this in human interactions, too, uh, again, with police and those who are protesting that when there's a joining or, or, or a, an acknowledgement, look, I am with you, I'm sorry, that that there's just healing that comes. And what, what I unfortunately see in the church still uh, are those who are just, they're just angry at everybody else. Mm -hmm. they're, they're quick to point out everybody else's sin, but there's no introspection. Mm -hmm. 
And James tells us that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And so we have this brand of Christianity that's just angry. I've heard people speak, say that they're the prophetic voice. They're just angry. But it's, it's, it's nothing prophetic. It's, it, it's, it's, it's pharisaical. You know, we've been going through John, and we see that, that Jesus heals a man uh, on the Sabbath. And people miss the healing and say, why did you do it on the Sabbath? Mm-hmm. And I'm speaking to you who are watching, who are just angry at everything, but you've not taken the time to examine yourselves. We need to examine ourselves. And I do, I think you're right. If there's going to be healing uh, in a systemic fashion, it, it starts with the individual. We have to all acknowledge our place and stop pointing the finger and say, what do I do to change? M- Maria, uh, you work in uh, employment services with, with the state of Ohio. And one of the questions that came in was, how does systemic racism affect employment opportunities for people of color? And, and in what ways can the, the church advocate for for people of color? So I think the better question is how does systemic racism affect the people of color through the employment opportunities? Um, And again, this is a 400 year struggle. So, but let me just throw some numbers out so that people understand um, the differences and the disparities that black and brown people struggle with every day when it comes to employment. So in 2018, because that's the last um, statistics that that the state of Ohio has on on wages, white men made an average of $64,000 a year. That's average. Their black counterparts made $46,000 a year. White women made $44,000 a year. And sadly, for black women, their numbers are $24,000 a year. And I say sadly because for many black women, they are raising children on their own. And I can't even imagine having two children in a home where you are paying rent and buying food and you're making less than $2,000 a month. It's no wonder that people need food assistance. It's no wonder that they need to, to file for Medicaid because if they were to pay for their employer's insurance, that would take half of their paycheck. Um, The wage disparity creates um, struggles with housing. It creates struggles in transportation. Because if I'm making $20,000 less than the man sitting across the aisle from me, I can't live in his neighborhood. I often can't buy a car to get to work. it, my children don't get the amenities that his children get, and that's not even the luxuries. Those are the necessities. And this is all, this goes back not just to slavery, but to black laws, to redlining, to Jim Crow, to segregation. It goes back so far, and it's not even um, the inheritance that, that whites get. You see, racism is the white elephant in the room. It's, it's what everybody knows is there, but nobody wants to talk about unless we witness a murder that took almost 10 minutes by a man who was not being defiant. And when we witness that, that creates trauma. And when we witness it over and over again, that creates systemic trauma. And so while I don't agree with looting, I do agree with the anger, and I understand why people are angry and they're combative. But let's get back to employment. So when someone um, applies for a a position, uh, a black man or a woman are eight times as likely not to get called back. Stanford University did a, um, a study a couple of years ago, and they they literally trained 200 black and white participants to act the same, to have the same colloquialisms, to, you know, just go in and have the same, they gave them all the same backgrounds. 
the white people were, were called back 90% of the time for a second interview. The white people, they, two out of 10 were called back for interviews. For, for, the, black, for the black? For the black people, yeah. It, the same thing happened on LinkedIn a couple of years ago, and it also happened 10 years ago. So um, resumes were submitted by, um, with the exact same, it was the exact same resume. One woman was named Lisa, the other was named Shakia, and 90% of the submissions for Lisa got an interview. Shakia got called back. I think, what was it, 11% of the time? There is no, no other reason for this but racism. Um, and, and yes, I, I agree with Tim. It takes us, we have to examine our own biases. You know, the psalmist said, search my heart, O Lord. And I think when we search our heart, we say, mm, I'm good. You know, I'm good. We're not good. Racism is that elephant in the room. And if we don't acknowledge it, if we're not willing to say, wow, you know, maybe I, maybe I do act differently around people who don't look the same as me. Maybe I do. Um, maybe I do cross the street when, when there's a black man on the, on the same side of the sidewalk. You know, when we're able to acknowledge that, then we can start saying, okay, now it's time to, to, to develop a radical empathy, mm -hmm. you know, to, to just dive into, let's understand. And I so agree with you. When you talked about your officers, it starts from the beginning. So as parents, it starts when our kids are young. Yeah. Are, we, are we reading them books about, not about racism, but are we about inclusion? Yeah. You know, are we, I, I read somewhere a long time ago when a bank teller is taught how to identify a counterfeit bill. They're not given counterfeits, they're given the real thing. To study it. To study it. Amen. Are we the real thing? Yeah. Do we invite people of color into our home to have dinner with our family? Can, Do can, we invite? Can I, can I segue there? Because, because, sure. because my Maria <laughs> and I were talking about that very thing, Maria. Uh, and, uh, you know, kids, home, environment, Maria, what would you add to that? Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me make the yeah. question a little broader. Um, how, how do we uh, train our kids? How, how do we raise up family? Mm. Yeah. I honestly feel like I'm going to be repeating exactly what Tim said, exactly what you said, Maria. Um, but in thinking about the question about our, our children, it is difficult. Um, I think most of us, black or white, we tend to not talk about it in, in our homes. And I think more so for white families. I think black families, because of um, the environment and what's, been, what's happening, we, you know, for our older kids especially, we do talk to them about what to expect when they walk out the door, you know, how to um, respond when they're stopped by, by an officer just because of, of what's happened. But um, for our younger, younger children, we tend, especially as Christian parents, to focus on um, teaching them the Bible, teaching them right from wrong, which is true and right. But I think also as uh, parents, we have the responsibility to prepare our children for what's out in the real world so that when they leave and, and leave our homes and go out, they're not saying to somebody, oh, you're the first black person I've ever met or, you know, interacted with. I have um, to interject. Okay. Because my daughters... I, both of them, when they were in high school, they would come home and say, Mom, if another white person asked me to touch my hair, I am going to scream. <laughs> it, it's just, yeah, it's a different, it's a different perspective. It is. It is. And, you know, I think we have to make um, decisions about how we talk to our children. Um, and you've heard the expression, what you do is far less important, what you say is far less important than what you do. And to what you're saying, Maria, you, I, I boil it down to two things. Uh, one is education. And when I say that, I mean educating ourselves, uh, digging deep, just like Tim was saying. Um, it's hard to do, but to see, ask the Lord to seek you out and, and point out areas of racial bias within yourself mm -hmm. that you can work on. Because, and then your, and your, and your husband, your parents, 
think about where did my biases come from and what can I do to change that? Um, because believe me, who your children are around, they'll pick up on those things. So recognizing that within yourself and making efforts to change that is so important. It is hard. It is hard. It's not impossible. And, you know, praying and, and asking the Lord to help you in that, that's huge. And then let your, your children see you trying to make those changes and tell them why. Tell them you thought this way, but you re recognize now that that's not right. I want to change that. And that'll speak volumes to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then educate yourself on black um, history. And I'm talking to all of us. Um, it's not just a February thing. No. You know, you have to know that there are black Americans who have um, been involved and invented things, everyday things. Mm -hmm. Did you know that it was a black um, person that invented the ironing board or traffic lights? You know, things like that, that we can talk to our children the super about. Soaker. The, uh, the super soaker. Super <laughs> soaker. <laughs> <laughs> Those are yes. important. You, ha you know, we need to make things normal um, in, in our children's lives. And then also to what you're saying, um, your circle, make it diverse. Mm -hmm. You know, you look, look at you, the toys and the books that you have in your homes. All of us, are, do they represent all cult cultures? Do you have stories about black families um, as well as white families? Do you have dolls that are black and white? Mm -hmm. These are the types of things that are gonna um, help your children to love all people. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I always, I wanna include this because there are so many books that you, that you can have your kids read. I remember when I was in junior high school, I read Maniac McGee and it, every, it's a Newbery Award winner and it's still popular. Have your teenage child or your junior high kid read it. Um, LeBron James just wrote a book called I Promise, great book. Uh, Bev Tatum, uh, can we talk about race? Have your kids read it or read it with them at night. What a great way, I mean, to be a part of a devotional and to talk about what, how those interactions affect you. I just, I, there's so many books that are available. Yeah. Maria, make sure you, you pass those on to us because we want to provide resources for uh, our viewers, our listeners, our, our church after this. Uh, we'll, we'll include that uh, uh, with the, with the next uh, update that we do, Brian, can I give yeah, one yeah, one sure. story? And uh, Maria, I want to um, as you were as you were speaking. I think one of the things that I'm hopeful for is is that um, I have committed to lending my white voice um, into these discussions um, because I'm hopeful that that perhaps people who are in the early stages of change are about to be willing to contemplate change might be able to hear it from me uh, fairly clearly. And as you were talking, Maria, you were talking about looking back at our family histories about uh, can we understand where our biases and implicit biases have formed. Um, my wife and I, we, after our first child was born, um, were struggling with some fertility struggles and we didn't think we were going to be able to have um, additional biological children. And so we started the adoption process. And as we were going through that process, one of my family members um, looked at me and said, you're not going to adopt a black baby, are you? And I remember I was incensed. I was, I was furious. Um, but for those of you that are listening that might be feeling defensive within this conversation, as I tell that story, I want to ask you, would you be willing to just consider, do you think you might have had that kind of response mm -hmm. if one of your children said, we might be adopting a black baby? Would you have any kind of internal reservation? Would you have any kind of, of internal response that says, oh my God, no. That, and can you be honest with yourself and mm -hmm. saying, if you have those, and you likely do, we all have those types of biases that show up, will you at least consider being honest with yourself and saying, I'm going to take a look at it because we all have them. That, that's good, Tim. You, you know, again, Maria, like yourself, light, light, light skinned man. 
I, I clearly have uh, European and African ancestry. Uh, I've got relatives that look completely white. Um, and my son uh, would, w wanted to be on this panel with us, as a matter of fact, but he's actually visiting his girlfriend this weekend. His girlfriend lives in Tennessee and happens to be white. And he's talked to us about this. How, how do you feel about me dating a, a white woman? And, and it's like, the biggest thing for us is that we want to know that this person knows the Lord. We want, so it doesn't matter to, to us. And, and we, in our families, bo on both sides, we've got a lot of uh, interracial marriages and so forth. And we, we love people. We've been taught that. We're, we're taught that from, from when we were growing up. But one of the things I did say to my son is, that, that's not any trouble for us in terms of the relationship, but you got to be careful, and you got to know that when you're going certain places, you be very careful. When you're driving in a car with her, be careful. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and as a matter of fact, he said that, that her grandfather now has disowned her because she's dating a black man. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, there are those challenges that come with that, but it does start, as you were saying, Maria, with with the home and, and what do we model. We have always modeled having people in our home from various backgrounds, various mm -hmm. cultures. Um, you yeah. mentioned in our conversation, Maria, even how, how, do we, how do we, if you're living in a predominantly white community, what can you do? You're living in Marysville, what can you do? You've got so many black friends. <laughs> <laughs> All the same friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> False, right? <laughs> um, that's true. Yeah, diversity is in your friendships. It's key. Is uh, um, I did ask uh, our children too about that. Um, how did we do as parents? You know, in uh, introducing race, and our daughter couldn't remember actually sitting down and talking about it. But she said she does remember the friends, the people that came into our house, the people that came over and had dinner with us, which was very impactful. Um, if you don't live in a diverse area, get creative. There are a ton of cultural festivals you could take your family to, um, events you could take your family to, movies you could watch together as a family. There are things you could do. And it's not about just having a friend who's of a different race. Um, it's, it's your lifestyle. And it's also doing things that your children see, children can see you having fun with someone, uh, going out with uh, people of other, other cultures. Um, we just have to be um, open to inviting all people. Um, my, my sister did something once one year, which I think was a great idea for you to do with your family. She gave her husband a gift of a um, day a month um, of dinner. And but by the way, Maria's sister is married to a white man. Yes. And so what they did is they made it a family event and they chose a different country each month. And that day, for instance, if it was India, that day they would go to an Indian restaurant. They would um, research and find an Indian event in their community and go to that. And then they'd even dress um, in, you know, clothing that they could find. And so each month they did a different um, country. And I think that's a great uh, thing or idea to do with your families to yeah. make sure your children are exposed. And, and then, you know, uh, Haven, uh, you know that, that one of the ministries that we partner with is, uh, is International Friendships, International, um, uh, International Friendships, Inc., IFI, uh, that ministers on the, the OSU campus. It's, it's, it's a great way to, to meet people from different cultures, different countries, uh, to be with people, uh, even if you're living here in Marysville. And, uh, Mike, let me ask you this, because uh, you've got young kids. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the things that you've done to help your kids? We've, we've tried to do some of the, the things that both Maria's have talked about, whether it's read some books, have some conversations. And, and one sweet thing that is maybe just a little blessing of our particular part of Mill Valley is our kids are exposed to to people from various backgrounds. As we look every, every given day, you know, there's eight, 10, 12 kids running around our, our backyard, our neighbor's backyards. And outside of my, my four kids, only two of the other kids are white. There's this diverse uh, kind of play group, you know, and they just have a great time together. So we, we consider that a privilege um, and want to want to continue to um, you know kind of cultivate this this love for all people that there isn't a 
division. Um, they hopefully haven't seen that from us. We want to model that well. We want to continue to learn and grow ourselves. And, and the events of this last week have really urged us and spurred us on to want to have more of those conversations, especially with Jackson and Kenzie, who can process it at a different level. Um, but yeah, we want to want to be a part of helping helping that to be normal. That this is a part of their growing up experience. That there isn't these divisions. Hopefully, don't they don't see that from us. We want to um, help and in, uh, yeah. yeah cultivate that. So 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 Mike, uh, as I as I mentioned in my introduction, you are on staff with Crew College Ministry. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that's been very encouraging to me personally is seeing uh, this next generation really speaking up on this issue, uh, yeah. that, that they're pressing those of us who might be a little older, and how do we uh, bring about this change? And, and you, you know, as you look again at the history of our country, uh, changes happen over generations. And it seems to me, I, I'm being optimistic, I'm being hopeful that this next generation is saying, we, we, wanna, we wanna really address this. And what, what are you seeing on yeah. college campuses, Mike? What, what, is, what is CREW yeah. doing to, to help foster this uh, racial unity, racial reconciliation? Yeah, you know, college campuses are a microcosm of our country, of, of our world in a lot of ways. So reactions can vary from people just being ignorant, that this isn't an issue, it maybe was, it isn't anymore. Uh, people can be indifferent, like, you know, that's for somebody else to address, it's for somebody else to tackle, it's not, it's not my place. I have other, other things, like I'm going to school, I'm working. Uh, there can be a lot, of, a lot of that kind of stuff. Other students that you know, have seen some different things, maybe from their background, uh, oftentimes college campuses can be pretty segregated um, in where students hang out. So it can be hard to find, uh, well, where are the, the students of color? Where are they at on this campus? What do they like to do? Uh, where, where are they interacting with one another? Do, do the uh, majority culture and minority culture students interact? How does that happen? Um, so, so there's a lot of those things at play that uh, you know, the, the various dynamics we see in our world are on the campuses. Uh, but I would say that there is, there is uh, optim a reason to be optimistic, because I think students are, are seeing that. The younger generation is noticing the, the sins of the father and wanting to do something that's wanting to be a part of change, wanting to be a part of breaking these systems that have uh, served to, to hold people back and, and oppressed others. Uh, so I think there is great, great reason for hope. Um, but we need to break down those walls on the campus too. How do we get groups of students together? So Maria, one of the things you mentioned, like in a predominantly white community, how do we get, how do we have interactions with, with ethnic minority cultures? Go to a, a festival, go to an event. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've tried to encourage our students to do. Hey, if you see the Black Student Union having an event or uh, I think of you know time this fall, I took one of my disciples to um, a Saudi Arabian festival on campus. So we got to walk through, and, and there was one of the guys who's a part of that group, he, he is Saudi, is processing the gospel, and would come to crew regularly, would come to IFI uh, regularly. Uh, and it was just a great way to be a blessing to him personally, but also to get to learn about this culture that's very different than ours, mm -hmm. uh, and interact with more students that I would have never seen otherwise. Yeah. Uh, and and I think Cruz tried to be proactive in, in engaging ethnic minority cultures is we're a predominantly white organization. And, and that is not reflective of the percentages on campuses. And we want to be a place where everybody, every student has an opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel. We don't want their ethnicity to be a hindrance. We don't want that to be a barrier. Right. So that means I need to learn. I need to grow personally. I need to read. I need to have conversations. Uh, I need... It's invaluable for me to hear stories, you know, like like your sons. That like, hey, watch watch where you're going uh, with with your white girlfriend. Like that, that's not my experience. I'm not going to have those conversations with Jackson. You know, him driving and be be on the lookout for what uh, what might be out there. That's not my reality. But it is for students that I encounter. It is for some of our minority at the minority staff. And this uh, this past Wednesday. Uh, our team hosted a Zoom call for our students uh, where they got to hear from our two, uh, two black staff as well as one of their brothers uh, who's a church planner in, uh, in urban Philadelphia and got to hear from his experience. Uh, he's also married to a white woman 
And he, he recounted a story of their dating relationship where they're walking in her neighborhood. Um, and he sees a cop car, and he's like, he, he thought to himself, he's coming over here. Um, and a few minutes later, the cop's there looking at his girlfriend saying, are you safe? Are you safe? Are you safe? And yeah, I'm in my neighborhood. I'm a couple blocks from my house. Then the officer looked to him, uh, hey, I need to see your ID. I'm with my girlfriend. And, and that has never been a part of my reality. Yeah. And, and I wanna be a part of helping, helping our students uh, understand uh, just the sin of the world uh, and how can we address it with, with our friends. And some of that is like, man, we have, to, we have to engage with the entire campus. We have to build friendships. How do you do that? There are people in your classes. Get to know people. How do you, how do you make friendships normally? Uh, have a conversation. Uh, take you know, take your friend out for coffee, for a meal, someplace they would want to go, um, and enter into that conversation. Listen. That can be hard because we we are pressed and we have our we have our views, and when when that gets uh, encroached on, it can be difficult. We can be defensive, but I, I would just uh, I encourage our students to listen. I, I want to do that myself. I want to model that. Yeah. Do I do that perfectly? Absolutely not. I, I don't think our ethnic minority friends are asking us to be perfect either. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good point, Mike. And and again, to those of you who are watching, um, perhaps never really entered the conversation before. Um, <laughs> I've had people ask, you know, is it okay for me to ask? And we were we were setting up yesterday and just joking around a little bit, and and uh, Lisa asked. Is it, you know, w when we say like, uh, we talk about a, a coffee brand called Jamaican Me Crazy, is it okay for, to, for us to say that? You know, you know sometimes we're, we're, I say, yeah, it's fine. You know, so we're just having, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, sometimes those are the questions that, that people ask. Is it okay for me to say such and such and such? And I'll tell you that for the most part, uh, black people are saying, if you're willing to engage the conversation, we're glad to have the conversation. Sometimes we might scratch our head and go, really, you're really asking that question? But it's good that the questions are being asked. That there's a, a humility that says, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to say, I don't know it all. It's difficult when somebody has all the answers and they're, and they're spewing out really just stuff that somebody else has said and they, there's nothing original in what they're saying. They just kind of, what about this, what about that? You know, one of the questions that came in, and, and I want to address this, is uh, what about the hashtag Black Lives Matter uh, versus hashtag All Lives Matter? And uh, just to, to give a little history on that, you know, there, there are those of you who are just entering this conversation on race. You, you, you're not really... You don't know the history of it. You've been, uh, quite honestly, a bit sheltered by this. Well, just in terms of the history, the, the, the hashtag Black Lives Matter came about in 2013. Uh, I, I, was, I was thinking back on this and said, wow, how time has flown because you know, it seems like it was just yesterday. But it was in 2013, it, it, it came out on social media after George Zimmerman was acquitted in the shooting death of Trayvon Martin. That, that's where it began. And there were protests and rioting and all that back then. And, and there's so many people who missed the, 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 the heartbeat of what this is saying. And so there was, um, people see the rioting, looting, the, the, the forms of pr protest that we would say we don't agree with, but they look at that and they, and they missed again. W what is this really saying? And so you'd have... Um, there was a hashtag came out in, in, in response and reaction, all lives matter. Hashtag blue lives matter. And yeah, w we would agree with that. Of course that's true. Of course that's true. B but it, it, it really comes across as a bit, not just a bit, very dismissive. Like w what you're saying doesn't really, because all lives matter. Of course blue lives matter. Of course all lives matter. 
And uh, again, some of you who are new to the conversation, I, I feel your heart that you are really in agreement with what the hashtag Black Lives Matter means, which is that we're with you. Of course, all lives matter. But you got to understand the history. And the history of all lives matter was really a dismissal of black lives. In other words, don't, don't talk to me about it. Of course, all lives matter. I, I've seen some really good uh, illustrations online on this, you know, and... and you know, we, we think, first of all, of, of um, Luke 15. You know, uh, many of you are familiar with the story. Uh, Jesus t In Luke 15, he tells three parables about the Lord seeking after the lost. And, and the first of those parables, he tells, is of there, there are a hundred sheep, and, and one wanders. And the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one. And the 19, well, I'm, I'm adding a commentary to Jesus' parable now. The 19 are going, hey, don't our lives matter? Of course your lives matter. But this one is in danger. This life is in danger. A and so when we say black lives matter, we're, we're not, of course we understand that every life matters. You, you know, I saw another illustration where, you know, a, a, a woman says to her husband, a woman who is in a place of, of, of abuse, and she says, do you love me? The husband responds, I love everybody. And that's true, but it's, it's hurtful. It's hurtful. You know, um, somebody says to you, you know, my father just died. And you say, well, all parents die. And it, it, it's, it's dismissive. It's, it's painful. And, and so I was talking to my son about this, you know, and he said, you know, what people are not understand is that when we say black lives matter we're saying black lives matter too would you understand that and, and so again for the, those of you who are again newer to the conversation and and I, I know you have the heart to say I'm feeling the pain and, and you want to repeat the hashtag all lives matter it's it's not helpful it, it's hurtful as a matter of fact it's, it, it's dismissive and so I'd say especially to those of you who call in the name of the Lord to, to be willing to, to learn through this conversation that we've had today to say, um, uh, uh, I, I want to enter into your pain. I want to enter into your empathy. This is the body of Christ. Just last week as I was preaching through John 11, we see Jesus uh, meeting up with, with Mary and Martha uh, after their brother Lazarus has died. And, and he says, he sees Mary who is wailing. She is in grief. And, and he, he's about to raise Lazarus. And he knows he's going to do this. He told his, his disciples before, and I'm about to raise him. I'm, I'm going to bring glory to God. So he knows what's going to happen. But he, he enters the, the pain of Mary. And it says Jesus wept. And so I say to you who are watching, if you call on the name of the Lord, we have to be ready to empathize. You might think you have a lot of the answers already, but we're not asking you to give all your various answers that you're just repeating from somebody else. Enter into the conversation. This is a first conversation. We want to continue this. Um, you know, we talked about the, 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 there are four L's to this, and, and hopefully you're learning, hopefully you're listening. Um, as next steps, you know, let, let, me, let me just briefly... What, what next steps can we take? Any, any of you who would like to share? What, what, what could be some good next steps from this? I think one that immediately comes to mind for me, and it's, it's more of an internal step than it is a, an external step, is we need to, we need to become thinkers. Um, one of the things that happens within group dynamics is that we tend to leave all of our thinking to our leaders. And, and currently, um, if you just are following political leaders and you abdicate your thought process to a political affiliation, you're going to miss the boat. Like you're going to, you're going to be taken down a stream that is thoughtless, and all you will be doing is recanting talking points that are in opposition to one another. And so the step I would encourage us all to take is to become thoughtful and, and take responsibility for our own um, internal cognitive processes and, and re-engage in critical thinking. 
Yeah. I, I, let, let me just say uh, along those lines, Tim, um, for those of us who call on the name of the Lord, I say this all the time, any of you who are part of this church, we ought not allow political categories to, to shape our worldview. Our worldview needs to be shaped by God's word. Yeah, and, and I was going to say, too, if, if you've been watching this and your immediate response is, but what about? Mm. What about this? What about that? So you're saying this is fine, but what about the riots and the looter, looting and those kinds of things? Just pause for a second. Learn. Listen. En engage one of us in some maybe a hard conversation. Uh, I, I would love to listen. I would love to help you process um, and there are a lot of great resources. We're going to send out a number of things. This can be an opportunity for you to watch some videos, to read some books, read some articles. There's a lot of great stuff out there that I know I've benefited from and have, has changed my perspective dramatically over the last several years and in, in, even in this, this brief season here. Uh, so if your response is, but what about? Pause, think, engage people, learn and see, see if your perspective might be changed. And I'd, I'd say I, I love the idea of engaging. Um, get to know somebody. Get to know better a neighbor or a coworker that's a different color than you. So I think that the church, and I'm just talking about Haven. I'm not talking about the church universal because there's a lot of things going on there. But I think that we cannot just say, we are anti-racism. I think we need to visibly be. And because when we're treating someone outside of ourselves as if, and when we're debasing someone for whatever reason, for the color of their skin, for their nationality, we are in fact denouncing the fact that we are all created in God's image. Mm, that's good. And, and if we continue to do that, we can no longer call ourselves children of God. So I, I, I feel like we, yes, Mike, we need to continue the conversation, whether individually or collectively, and don't be afraid to approach someone and say, you know, I just have some, I just have a few questions because I'm curious. You know, please don't take offense. But I know... Um, that in other conversations, I, I kept telling Pastor, man, that Micah 6 8 is just smacking yes. me in the head. Yes. Yes. It's yes. smacking me because God has told us what is good. Good meaning correct, holy, good meaning complete. And it's to do justice. And so doing justice mean, it means acting in his moral character. And it's loving mercy. That means letting go of those offenses that we have put upon other people and other people have put upon us. And to walk humbly, oh my gosh, we need to let go of our pride. Oh, come on now. We need to let go come of our now. pride and be able and willing to reach out to other people so that we can learn and understand. And like I said, we need to develop a radical empathy because I believe when Jesus wept, that's what he was showing. He was showing a radical empathy for the sorrow that those sisters were, were having for their, their brother. Yeah. And whatever that looks like upon this church, we need to be doers of the word. Yeah, good. Well, it's been very enlightening for me to sit here. And, you know, I'm not a member of your church, but I, I feel the welcome for being here. Uh, I'm, I've learned a lot of things sitting here. Uh, haven't said much but really been thinking about what has been said. Uh, I think we all do need to look inside ourselves first and then see how that affects others and our viewpoint. I know in law enforcement, uh, a term totality of circumstances uh, is often used. And in the world we're living in right now, I think that's very appropriate. Mm -hmm. Not to focus on any one thing, but how each one cause and effect. And, and they were all human. And as humans, we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And we answer to a higher power, you know, if not now, ultimately. Ultimately, yeah. Yeah, so I mentioned at the beginning the four L's of 
reconciliation. There is the listening and the learning. I hopefully, all of you who are watching this have been doing that. You've been listening and learning, and uh, there's so much more for us to listen and to to learn from. Uh, but the third L is that when you hear from God and he's spoken to you and you know that this has been an area that you need to get right. You know, you know, the walk with Jesus is one where I don't enter into this relationship until I acknowledge my own sin, my brokenness, and then the Lord wipes it away. But walking with him is an ongoing life of repentance. You know, um, John writes in 1 John chapter 1, 8 and 9, he says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. In a moment, we're going to be taking communion together. And Paul urges us that before we do that, we examine our hearts. And uh, the third L of this process is that we lament that we willingly say, God, search me out, and I lament, I hurt, I pray. And I've asked Mike to lead us now in a prayer of lament. Uh, Mike, if you could do so. Yeah, so this, this prayer is based on resources from Redeemer Church in, in New York City. And lament, uh, if you're not familiar with that word, is, is just an ex- a passionate, deep expression of grief and sorrow. And one of the resources that we're going to pass along uh, is, a, is a sample lament prayer. Uh, it's based on Psalm 13, one of the most, maybe the most basic lament psalms. Uh, and it's going to walk through some just ways for you to process emotions, process this issue. And I would encourage you to take some time to do that personally this week. Uh, write out a lament psalm for all the injustice that's going on in our nation, for where you're at in the midst of it. Uh, and would, would you pray with me here? Lord, we lament the brokenness of our world, and in particular, our country. We grieve with those who are hurting physically, emotionally, and spiritually during this time. We lament in particular with the black community in our own city and state. Lord, we are grieved by the suffering of our black brothers and sisters whose injustices in our educational, healthcare, housing, and employment systems. Lord, we cry out to you, Um, against uh, uh, policies constructed with oppression in mind and underlying racism. We cry out against the explicit and implicit actions that have bred and continue to breed inequity. We cry out and repent of our hearts when we see and turn away, when we know and do nothing. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. And so we pray, oh God, break our hearts Mm -hmm. for the communities bearing so much suffering. And Lord, if this grief is uncomfortable, let us sit in that discomfort, not to feel bad, but so that we may repent before you and ask for your healing, grace, and redemption. Mm -hmm. We bring our hearts to you, God. Break, Break our hearts for what our black neighbors are experiencing and spur us all toward the sovereign love and power of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So we may witness and participate in your healing grace and justice in all of our communities and cities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we are going to uh, participate in the Lord's Supper right now. Uh, for those of you watching, hopefully if you're part of Haven, you've, you've collected your elements from the, from the foyer area. And um, we invite you to, to take those right now. It was on the night the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed. He was taking the Passover meal with his disciples. The Passover is a, a, a celebration of God's deliverance from, of God's people from the oppression of Israel. And it had been celebrated in, in the life of, of Israel for many generations. And uh, they, they would take of the, the wine and of the 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 bread, the unleavened bread, and it was a reminder of that Passover angel. They would mark their doorposts with the blood of the Passover lamb. And Jesus was explaining to them that all these symbols that they had been celebrating over the generations really was pointing to him, that he was the Passover lamb. And so it was on that night that the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed. If you could grab your elements, panel. Uh, that he took 
the, the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, Jesus, we remember your shed blood. Let's drink together. In the same manner, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your shed blood, for your broken body. Thank you that you are alive today, and thank you that because of the work that you've done in us, that we know that we have life in Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, for the symbolism of this communion, that we are one, that there is one body, one Lord, one baptism. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that, you, Lord, you're not done with us. We confess that we have fallen short. We have ignored the sins of this land, our own personal sins, but we thank you, God, that you are changing us, you're transforming us, you are Holy Spirit, you are conforming us to the likeness of Jesus. Thank you so much for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So there is four L's. There's to learn, to listen, to lament. And, and the fourth L is that we leverage. We take whatever platforms we do have, and some of us have larger platforms than others, and we say, we want to impact those in our own spheres. It might just be a family. It might be your family. It might be whatever our viewership is on social media. It might be that you have a friend who is posting stuff that you're looking at and saying, this is ignorant. And you come alongside them lovingly, patiently, and say, let me help you with this. But we need to leverage. The conversation is not ending. We, we hope again that the things that you've heard today will spur us on toward love and good deeds and that there is so much more to come. I want to say thank you again to each of our panelists. Thank you for taking time to be with us. Special thanks to the Chief Golden for taking time out of your busy schedule and, and being with us. And uh, thank you all. Blessings to you. Blessings to you, church. We will have some resources available for you. Uh, uh, if you're meeting in one of our house churches right now, you'll have some questions for reflection. We invite you to take a few moments to go through those. Blessings. Have a wonderful week, church.